My name is John Stevens, and I hail from a little country way down the other side of the world called New Zealand. Throw the place down, wild as the wind, where you came from, it's like a million miles away. I've been singing all my life, making music all my life. I grew up in a musical household. I'm half native New Zealander, which is called Māori, Māori and uh, it's a singing culture, musical culture, so uh, I'm, it's in the DNA. I grew up in a family of 11 children, six girls and five boys. I'm the youngest, so I got knocked around a lot. <laughs> Uh, we grew up in a little town called Upper Hut. It was very beautiful and uh, it's kind of crazy underneath. One shot will take you. You've got one life. Don't you waste it when you fall out to pieces. You're not the only one pleased to meet you. Heartbreaks, innocence, blind love leaves you breathless. Flatline, senseless when you're on the road, feeling desperate. Hold on, can't you see? John Stevens is a real force of nature. He arrived at the studio in LA literally straight from the plane and we began writing songs immediately. We talked about anything and everything you can imagine. And then at seven o'clock PM, we bonded over one of my famous martinis. Māori race is a, is a race of warriors, and my dad was from Glasgow, my mother's Māori, and so we have this two tribal thing in our DNA. And uh, our dad, well, he always taught us to uh, stand up for yourself, don't take any shit from anybody. And so, you know, I'm the 11th child, like 10 brothers and sisters, we all went to the same schools, and I had some of the same teachers that they had. So, you know, I get to high school, I'm 13 years old, first out of high school. The teacher comes up to me and he, he says, oh, Stevens, 
where do you come? I said, I'm number 11, sir. I'm the last. And he leans into my ear and he goes, I can't fucking wait to get rid of you, boy. <laughs> was it? War. I'd been warned about it, but that was war, and I, I lasted a year, a year and a bit, and I got expelled. I got expelled from school, I was 14, 14 and a half years old. It actually wasn't legal. <laughs> Yeah, Guilty is um, pure, pure swamp, really. Um, rock and roll swamp music, you know, I call it. Dave just, you know, wailing on his guitar. And um, it's a sort of, I guess it's a little story about a man who comes home and finds this, you know, partner with another man and basically uh, guns him down. full of music and everyone's just singing from the minute I could start remembering anything. We didn't have a car, we didn't have a phone. We just made up our own adventures and, and, and you know, obviously music was the sort of, I guess the one thing that kept you happy <laughs> in an environment which, uh, you know, without music would be just completely grey. I always uh, sort of fantasised about, you know, been going on adventures, and I, I made it come true. I suppose I've been on adventures all my life, traveling around the world and and making music, and um, you know, and, and you know, making people happy. Because at the end of the day, I think that's what music is all about. Cha 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 oh, it. Here we go. Right here we go. Good luck to you. Hey. What makes you happy? You know, uh, Dave's riff was just so infectious and the groove the boys put down, it was just an instantaneous thing. And uh, I think, you know, to me, the first line, you know, um, you could be anything, but you'll never be tall. <laughs> it's like Napoleon, you can't have it all. Um, so it's, you know, humorous, you know, but what makes you happy? We all ask ourselves that question, right? <laughs>
My first major band was a band called Noiseworks. And um, we were sort of in our early 20s at the time and uh, all like-minded young blokes uh, playing the pubs in Australia and pub rock, um, you know, back in those days was just mad. Um, playing all the beaches all around the country, I mean, everywhere. You play six nights a week. And, um, you know, with bands like In Excess, uh, Midnight Oil, uh, Men at Work, uh, The Vinyls, I mean, there's just so many amazing Australian bands. Noiseworks, you know, became very, very successful in, in Australia. It sort of gave us the opportunity to, you know, tour through Europe and uh, America. As a young musician, your whole life is, you know, a dream about, you know, traveling and playing to, you know, to people, playing music. and. It didn't matter to us whether we were in Sweden playing to 100 people or, you know, in Germany playing to, you know, 10, 20, 30,000. Our schedule was pretty much uh, eight months on the road. We'd play six nights a week all around wherever and um, three months in the studio when you had big budgets back in those days. Uh, and we'd have a month off. That was our sort of yearly ritual. So by the time we got to the third album, we ended up producing ourselves and the band broke up. Actually, at our height, we had number one record, we sold out everywhere. And then one day we just went, no, 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 ain't fun anymore. So we just called it a day. So this is our last show, and we left. That was in with NXS started um, you know, back in the 80s um, and when Michael passed away the guys wanted to do a gig and would I sing with them and it was great you know I love their songs I love their great band you know great guys and Michael was a, a fantastic bloke and so it was one of those things where I sort of stepped in as a mate I ended up um, being singing with them for about three and a half years and unfortunately it was just sort of got to a point for me where there's um, no writing no real writing going on and, you know, I'm a, I'm a songwriter. I love writing songs and, and I just wanted to do my own thing again, so I said, ciao. <laughs> I wanted to bring John to Blackbird Studios in Nashville because for quite a few years now I've been coming to Nashville and recording at Blackbird with the same musicians who are a bit like the Nashville Wrecking Crew. I mean, these are the most amazing players you could possibly get to play with live or on a record. Chad Cromwell on the drums, you know, plays with Neil Young regularly and we've made many albums together. He played with me on Stevie Nicks' album I produced and Joss Stone's album I produced in Nashville. Michael Rhodes is just the most brilliant bass player. Soul music, blues music, rock music, country music. He just locks totally in with Chad and the two of them are like an amazing engine to have. Then I always like to throw in Dan Dugmore as the curveball because 
you never know what Dan's going to play. You know, he plays lap steel, pedal steel, acoustic, electric, and he's played with some of the most legendary acts in the country music world and rock music. You don't have to tell Dan much, you know, you just start playing the chords, he's already got it, and the next thing you know, he's playing stuff from outer space. And last but not least, I love to have Mike Rojas on the piano, Hammond organ, keyboards. Mike is an animal basically on the keyboards. He can dive in in the middle of the heaviest voodoo rock tune or be as light and delicate as possible on the piano as if he's playing on a David Bowie Hunky Dory record um, or a classical piece. You know, he's just got everything at his fingertips. He's a genius. Working with Dave Stewart has um, been absolute revelation for me because he, he's, you know, look, a lot of people have asked me over the years, you know, about songwriting and how, how you do it and how you did this and I said, I go, you know what, I don't see that now. I don't read music, I don't write music, I never learned to play anything, but I can play it and I can hum a tune and sing a tune and write lyrics. And I, and I can sit there, it's like, it's like a meditation. And it's like, uh, you know, I liken it to channeling because I don't quite know what it is, but I open myself up to receive. And Dave is exactly the same. And so him and I working together has been absolutely fantastic because we're just sort of like not second guessing each other on, on, on the creative side of things. And that's been uh, a, a joy to work, work with him. And um, obviously his track record speaks for itself. When I first met Dave, I said, hey, but we've met before. And he, of course, he, he didn't, couldn't remember. I said, we actually met in 1987 when you were touring in Australia with the Eurythmics. He goes, oh, yeah? I said, yeah, we were supporting you. My band Noiseworks was supporting you. And I said, you were really nice to us. You know, you didn't have to be because it was just a shit kicking support band. But you were really nice to us. And, you know, I always remembered that. So, you know, roll forward from 1987 to 2016. And I said, I remember you. You don't remember me. I remember you. So it's a, you know, it's one of those things I suppose as a young musician just, you know, you never know who you meet along the way and don't ever take anything for granted. We got together in Los Angeles and um, I walked into the room the first, first thing Dave said to me was, so, do you drink? And I'm like, uh, you know, I've been known to have a couple. He goes, good, martinis at seven. <laughs> and that was it, I said, okay, sweet. So we'd work all day and then at seven o'clock, would have a martini and then, you know, the vibration would change. Cheers. We'd be done by 10, but it was great. You know, it was, it was a good way to be because, uh, you know, the excesses of, uh, you know, your youth when you're recording or on the road, you know, um, was working with Dave's just very, very civilized. Everything's very civilized. <laughs> Dave and I started uh, songwriting from the minute we walked in the room together. And our creative connection was really, is really just like amazing, you know, really. Uh, and I'm so excited to be, to be working with him. Um, he's such a giving musician and uh, he doesn't ever impose, you know, it's always about just, you know, putting, we're just doing, we're just channeling the two of us. And, you know, he does his bit, I do my bit and it just works, you know, and, and that's exciting because it's, it's a hard thing to find that um, chemistry. That's the thing you're looking for, you're searching for in your life is chemistry, the right chemistry. I mean, there's, there's, there's songwriters around nowadays, I guess music today, a lot of it's paint by numbers music. There's a, there'll be a committee of, you know, three, four, five, eight songwriters. Whereas Dave, like me, we're all feelers, we're feelers. So we just feel it and move it around and capturing lightning in a bottle. It's a one-way street 
But if you believe Let the magic take you there we did a lot of this, the songwriting in LA and finished it up actually in Nashville. But, um, you know, every time we'd sit down to help with another idea, I'd always record everything on my phone. And I worked out that Dave and I never spent more than 15 minutes writing a song. Seriously, we'd come up with an idea like that. And there's one song on this record called One Way Street, which we wrote in four and a half minutes because he, he he said, I got these chords here and he started playing and I started singing something and I would stop, hold it, hold it. And I got my phone out and put it up. Four and a half minutes later, we'd written One Way Street from beginning to end. I had to go back and forth to Australia because uh, I I'm, was I'm on the road. I'm on the road in Australia, and so I had commitments touring. Um, so I came back to go to Nashville and to do finish up vocals and get Holly and, and Steffi to sing some background vocals and tighten things up arrangement wise. And it was great. We worked at Blackbird Studios with John McBride, and you know it was a great experience. It's just uh, we did a gig in between there too, and <laughs> Dave and I. Dave goes, "Oh, should we do a gig?" I'm like, "Yeah, sure." in between recording. So we went and played the songs we'd just written live, which was great, I always loved that. But you know, I would still, still didn't, you know, I'd written words and stuff, so everything was changing. It was just, a, you know, I love that spontaneity that's like, put you on the edge type thing, you know? Yeah, let's go, see what happens. Mr. John Stevens. Good evening, Mr. Dave Stewart, ladies and gentlemen. Should I go or stay? Hey, no one to be, so won't I be sorry? Smack down the middle, I was all damn on the ground here. When you're performing live, it's one of just, it's, it's, a, it's a different animal. You know, it doesn't matter where you are or who you're actually going to be playing in front of, whether it's 100 people or 100,000. For me, it's always the same. It's like all or nothing, and that's just how I'm wired. Smack down the middle, I can hear her cry. You've got to believe in what you're doing. You have to be committed as a human being, you know, and certainly you've got to be committed to performance. I'm like all about being real and authentic because that's all I've ever known. The one thing I've always said, you know, about getting on stage is, you know, you can't get out of it. So you may as well enjoy the experience and give everything you got.
don't go, oh, I'm too sick, I can't go on. No, nah, it doesn't roll. You get up there and you, and you have a crack, no matter how you feel, you know, because you're committed to it, so you, you, you better bloody do it, isn't you? I never let you down I stood by your side Why did you go out there? I seen that loneliness in your eyes It's all around the world You didn't think about it couldn't help yourself You're already too far gone Another fallen angel That couldn't reach the sun John was telling me about his first job working in a vinyl pressing plant in New Zealand when he was 15 or 16. And I thought it would be interesting for him to go to Jack White's shop in Nashville. Third Man Records, an amazing place. He has his venue in the back, he has his store, he sells vinyl, but he also has the most amazing machine. I think it's the only one in existence that still works and you can cut your own vinyl record in real time. The one take recording booth. Well, hopefully one take <laughs> of one shot. That's all it takes, right? Kia ora. It's like being on a rocket ship and like, you know, flying to the moon, it's all, it's making noise in it all of a sudden, as soon as it stops and the red light goes on, you're on. One take, that's it. Awesome.
and one. <laughs> she does. <laughs> That's awesome. That's amazing. It's just all distorted, which is great. <laughs> I think John, you know, is really um, the most amazing sort of strength of character. He knows that when he's got something that could be brilliant, that he's going to nail it. And when you see him go to reach for those notes, and you go, oh my God, how did he even do that? You can see him mentally. It's not all physical, even though John's a very powerful <coughs> character and, you know, coming from where he does in New Zealand. You can see the strength, but it's a mental prowess as well, that when somebody is about to do, you know, a high jump or a pole vault or a run a marathon, you can kind of see the winners. They're mentally already like Muhammad Ali, or like, oh, I'm gonna win in the first round and I'm gonna hit that note. So some of these notes that you're hearing John hit on the album as we're recording, let me explain. They are not normal. I said to the preacher, can you save my soul? Oh, Lord, I see you coming. Oh, Lord, you got me running. Oh, Lord, you keep coming. Oh, Lord, you got me running, running, running. Yeah, you got me running. Most male singers, probably 99.9% .9 could never even attempt to go there with the power and the range and then have the words be delivered and be part of a storytelling process with that voice it's like a double whammy. You can get out of the door a little bit faster but you don't necessarily have to keep speeding up. If you get out that door quite fast, you know, give me an extra 25% then when it came to shooting music videos and promotional photos for John, I wanted to try and portray a world in which John's life is crumbling around him, but in which he is just powering through it all. So here we go, once again, um, hallways and blowing things up. For the photo shoot, we went to this pretty incredible place called Paramore Mansion, and I shot John with a large format camera in various places, knowing that I was going to then distress the pictures. In other words, everything looked fantastic except there was a hole in the floor, or the wall was falling down, or the girl, Holly, was on fire or there's something really wrong in all of the pictures or a devil's appearing in the mirror so you got the idea that oh there's this whole world that looks fantastic and when you look closely there's all this kind of disaster imminent disaster happening music is is all powerful you know it can change your mood yeah, music shaped the world, um, and um, you know I've always tried to write songs that have meaning to me that move move me. I always believe that if I feel something, then somebody else will you know click into it as well and share in that that experience. But once I've sort of let it go, then it's obviously up to people how they interpret things. I'm a little like John, really, in the way that I'm obsessed with music and the power of music and the positivity it creates and knowing that music can change the temperature of a room, it can change the temperature of a hundred thousand people by just adding one note to a chord. I mean, it's limitless, the power of music. And I think John recognizes that. You know, the way I write is from, you know, I believe in ordinary perspective, I'm not trying to be cool, I'm not trying to be anything other than real. And, yeah, you know, real life. All I can say is like, wow, what an incredible 
singer and what an incredible co-writing, songwriting partner that I, you know, from all of the stuff I saw, I could get some bits, but not really the depth of the talent. And that was the most amazing surprise, I think, to all of us who played on the record and your <clears throat> willingness to go where, you know, people have never ventured vocally. <laughs> you know? I mean, like, you know, challenges like, yeah, why don't you go up with that bit, John? He goes, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because we write songs, it's all just to do with the, <clears throat> the other side of your brain, a stream of consciousness and stuff comes out and then it starts to become the theme of the song. And I think they're all great. You know? They're all about sort of killing people and... <laughs> <laughs> Taking you out is actually quite the oddball on the record, really, because it's quite, it's a very dark song. And it sort of harkens back to, uh, um, you know, uh, living with um, a junkie, I suppose, um, for want of a better word. And the relationship between, you know, two people that is really, you know, one wants to get out, get out of it and, you know, trying to pull the other person out of it. The other person is pulling them down. It's that, you know, one wants, one's got a stronger survival instinct than the other. And that song's quite, really quite a quirky, real dark little song. Um, it's one of my favorites for that reason. Hooked on me, hooked on me, hooked on speed, F-U-C. Love love parlez-vous français. I had a double heart bypass operation. You know, I'm it's pretty fit, thought I was, but I have a hereditary condition which my father passed away from and when I was 15 years old. Basically, if I hadn't gone in for a checkup, uh, the doctor said I would have, wouldn't have lasted the weekend. This was on a Thursday. <laughs> so I would have just been one of those statistics that just fell over and dropped dead. And it's just one of those things that's around the corner. <laughs> so, you know, maybe my, uh, most of my drivers, I'm trying to claim everything in before, you know, get the tap on the shoulder. You know, last really, last really important while you're here. So you just, you know, try to make a difference in people's lives and especially the people that, you know, you, you that uh, your family, your friends, and just keep, keep, uh, keep punching. I think as a songwriter, you know, I get, I have the luxury, I suppose, of being able to purge myself of inner demons because it comes out in the songwriting, you know. Um, other people go to see psychiatrists <laughs> or, or meditate and I meditate writing songs and I let go of a lot. never let you down I stood by your side Why did you go out there I seen that loneliness in your eyes All around the world You didn't think about it you couldn't help yourself already too far Starlight was one of the early songs that Dave and I wrote um, Dave just started playing acoustic guitar and I started singing and the usual thing is just these melodies start to unfold and we go to these different chords and all of a sudden we have this verse chorus and you know the chorus is such a 
the incredible jump from the verse work quite quite uh, different and, um, and we did uh, work on the lyrics a bit with that one and until we came up with the line starlight and then it kind of sort of grew out of there you know breaking through the shadows I can see by working with you that one of your favourite things is actually writing songs yeah. and melodies and words and sort of expressing yourself and things that have happened in a way that you can sing passionately about. And it's quite interesting writing with somebody else because I've done it a lot of collaborating. <clears throat> and my thing is always like, you know, yeah, let's get personal. <laughs> it's that um, the way you work is very similar to a lot of amazing uh, artist over the years I've worked with, which is you, you sing things, even in a jam session or if I'm playing a chord structure, and they're almost words, mm. and some of them are words, and what's great is we both go back and try and work out what that was. Mm. It's coming from a kind of, um, it's the other side of your brain really that's yeah. not trying to be logical. Yeah. And usually that means it's like a stream of consciousness about stuff that's happening yeah. in your life. So when you arrived, you had come from all of this stuff that had been happening and we went crashing into, you know, songwriting and I could see there was pages and words, <laughs> stuff was everywhere and it was kind of like a collage of your life, yeah. which we've sort of managed to put together like a jigsaw puzzle. It used to happen all the time in Australia, you know, in the, when you were playing in the bands in the pubs, the pubs of Australia, you used to write a bunch of songs and go out and play to a, well, to a crowd and test them out and throw out the ones that were shit ass, keep the ones that people liked and keep building upon that, so, hey, it's all about the people, right? It's you guys. That's right, we're all it's all about people. Oh yeah. It's all about the people, oh yeah. About the people, yeah. Uh, well, it is really at the end of the day. It's all about the people. Um, every day you get up, if you watch the news or you read the paper, I mean, it's just the same, same old stuff going on all around the world. You know, people fighting, killing, dying, raping, pillaging, everything's negative. And it kind of wears you down after a while. So, all about the people is really just, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's up to us to make a change, think differently, help each other out, you know, change the world we live in. Because it's, you know, it's the future of, you know, children's 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 children, and we shouldn't be so bloody selfish.
I don't know what to give Say To get rid of this loneliness Now all night I keep trying to find Some peace of mind Scars is, uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it's relatable. Anybody can relate to scars. We all have them, you know, em emotional scars from, you know, relationships or just life in general, right, you know? And uh, that's what this song's about. It's about a, you know, a long-time relationship that's, you know, you part ways and you wish you'd come back together, but it didn't happen, or this, that, and the other thing. It's just part of life. Um, and, you know, time, as you, get, as you go through life, you know, certainly as you get older, you, you think about those gone before. And, you know, sometimes you think, well, what would have happened? What if, you know? Um, so, you know, life is about collecting scars. It's about how you, how you rise above it and, and deal with them and, and move forward in your life. Shake my heart. I've always called myself a lifer. You know, these certain people are just lifers. We're always going to play music, no matter what. Trends will come and go. This will come and go. But we're always going to play music. You know, I've been pretty much making music all my life since I was a kid. And I'll be doing it till the day I die. And, and I hope I never find what I'm looking for. It's half the fun, isn't it?
today where I met my life. You know, I'm good today. I'm really good today.